This week on Q&A, Charles Evans Jr., producer and director of the new documentary titled Addiction Incorporated. He's joined by scientist and educator Victor DeNoble, whose work is highlighted in the film. Charles Evans, what is Addiction Incorporated? Addiction Incorporated is a film that I've worked on for quite a long time about um, the tobacco industry and about Victor DeNoble's uh, lifetime commitment to doing good with science. Where'd you get the idea to do this? I saw Victor testify on your network back in, I think, what was the first um, Senate subcommittee coverage of Waxman's of uh, the health and his Waxman subcommittee and um, wanted to know more. It, Victor got a lot of coverage. He you know, was front page news a lot of places. He had just refuted the seven CEOs sworn testimony that nicotine was addictive and um, I, I got his number through a journalist a friend and contacted him and got to know him better, saw him um, make presentations, educational presentations about drugs to kids and came to feel that that was the story that I wanted to tell and the backdrop would be the tobacco industry and his you know very dramatic experiences in it. And you are the Victor de Noble. Yes. Uh, how did you get started in this whole thing that has led to this documentary? Uh, well, it began in 1979 when I was contacted by Philip Morris Tobacco. Um, <clears throat> they, they said that they were having some problems, maybe I could help them, and I asked them what the problem was, and they said the problem was that nicotine uh, causes about 138,000 people to die every year from cardiovascular activity and brain strokes. And Wait, they, wait that uh, figure is again how much? Uh, 138,000 each year from heart disease and brain strokes. And they had a program in began in the 1970s where they wanted to remove nicotine from cigarettes and replace it with a drug that was equally addictive, but a drug that wouldn't cause the heart problems and brain strokes. And they had all these molecules that they invented, but they had no way to test them. And that was my job. My job was to come in and find a molecule that a rat's brain would say, I like it, and the rat's heart wouldn't have any cardiovascular problem with it. 79. Correct. And what were you doing at the time? I was a postdoc fellow at the University of Minnesota. My specialty is drug addiction, and I work with animals. And uh, I was working on alcohol addiction up there. And uh, when I went to Philip Morris, we established a laboratory. Um, and we established a, a, a laboratory to study the, the, the behavioral effects of nicotine on, on the brains of rats. Uh, I went to work there on April 1st, uh, 1980, 1980, and um, was asked to leave on April 5th, 1984 come back to that. Where were you at the time you watched the hearing and what were you doing then? I was in Los Angeles and I was trying to get movies made. A producer in Los Angeles had just started my own company and I think we were trying to get a movie made with Johnny Depp and um, this real life story just captured my attention. Did you have any feeling yourself about smoking? Um, not really. I mean, I had had some addiction issues with myself as a kid, but I never smoked cigarettes. And as it got further along, it became clear that covering that territory in a movie was perhaps part of the gal what galvanized me to the material. But um, I, I didn't really have a feeling. I'm not a crusader. I didn't really have an ax to grind with the tobacco industry or anything like that. You ever smoked? No. My mother and father both smoked. My father was a plumber. And, uh, my sister still smokes today, and most of my friends smoked in high school. Um, it wait, 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 wait. After all you've been through with this, your sister still smokes today? Yes. Nicotine addiction is something that's very, very hard to beat. People who are addicted to nicotine, they'll, they'll, they'll quit on average seven to ten times before they're successful. If you're a smoker and you've quit and you think you're sitting there going, I can't, I can't quit this and I'm a loser, you're wrong. You've changed the way your brain works, perhaps for the rest of your life. And there are some people that will never overcome the addiction. Now, my sister, of course, has done a great job. She's down to like five cigarettes a day, which is really fabulous. She used to be a two-pack-a-day smoker, and she exercises. But, you know, again, it's, it's an addiction. Here's some 
video of you testifying back in 1994? Correct. Was that what? Before the Waxman Committee. Let's watch just a little bit of it. I would like to state that senior research management in Richmond, Virginia, as well as top officials at the Philip Morris Company in New York, continually reviewed our research and approved our research. Senior management also reviewed and made final decisions determining whether data could be published, presented at scientific meetings, or even discussed in the scientific community. With regard to the Philip Morris press release dated March 31st, 1994, the statements made concerning my research and my assessment of the self-administration experiments are out of context and misleading. Further, during my employment at Philip Morris, three manuscripts were approved for publication. Two of these manuscripts were, sub two of these manuscripts were subsequently uh, ordered to be withdrawn by the company after this approval. In addition, a 1983 scheduled presentation of the nicotine self-administration paper at the American Psychological Association meeting was also blocked by the company. Finally, without prior discussion or prior warning, the Behavioral Pharmacology Laboratory was abruptly closed in April of 1984. When you were sitting there at that table, what was the federal government's position and the laws that had been passed about tobacco? Well, there, there really wasn't a, a very good position for the federal government. I think in 1984, uh, there wasn't, I don't think, any states that were smoke-free. There was no, and no smoking. You could smoke in restaurants and bars and hotels, you know, airplanes. Uh, so there wasn't really any kind of movement uh, against the tobacco industry. Uh, this was the first time that, that I think the public got, got to hear some stories that they suspected were true, but could never really prove. And so our job at that congressional hearing was to be scientists and to give people information and let them make their own decisions. When you testified, who were you working for at that time? I was working for the Department of, uh, of Public Health in Delaware. Uh, I was working with uh, um, people with special populations with learning disabilities. And did you have to get permission to make that testimony? No, I did not. Um, I, 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 went, uh, I took off from work and took leave time, and I testified as a citizen, not as an employee of the state. But I was really getting at the Philip Morris contract that you had signed. Yes. <laughs> we signed the contract, uh, and that contract was binding uh, until uh, April 14, 1994, at the congressional hearing with the seven CEOs. Uh, Congressman Sinar asked the president of Philip Morris, Mr. Campbell, he said, you know, we have a guy named Victor DeNoble who will testify, but you've got him silenced, and he, you, he wants to come here, but you, will you release him? And he said, well, we'll have to look at it, we'll get an investigation. That exchange between Congressman Sinar and Mr. Campbell went on for approximately seven minutes. And it was the longest seven minutes of my life, because had they held on and said no, I knew that the tobacco lawyers would never let our testimony come to light. But he finally gave in and said yes. And once that happened, I knew we were free to tell the truth. How many years did it take you to do the documentary? Uh, 15 or 16. From the first time that I heard Victor, I optioned his rights in 1996, so 15 years. What other kind of movies have you made? Uh, my last film was The Aviator. I produced The Aviator. Before that? Uh, film Johnny Depp's directing debut, The Brave, which did not get released in the United States. And so you, this is a documentary, the other stuff wasn't? Correct, narrative. And had you ever done a documentary before? Had not. My mom was a documentary filmmaker. She passed away when I was young, but I had never thought about it, really. Where'd you grow up? New York City. To what kind of a family? What were, the, what were your parents doing? Um, filmmaking family. Um, dad is a producer, uncle's a producer, cousins are in different areas of the entertainment business. And what kind of education did you get leading up to your time as a producer? Under, undergrad, Berkeley, um, short story writing, and graduate school, USC Film School. Where did you grow up? Uh, in New York, in uh, Valley Stream. What, where, well, what about your education? Um, high school and eventually got a PhD from Adelphi University in Garden City, New York. Went on to get postdoc fellowships from uh, Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York, and a second postdoc fellowship from the University of Minnesota. And then I went to work for Philip Morris. We have a clip of, from your documentary, and it starts with the early days in the life of Victor DeNoble. You're talking about, let's run that. Back in the 60s, teachers would pigeonhole people. You know, Victor is not very bright, so he's going to go to plumbing school like his dad. That's what the plan was, and, and that was my goal. One day, my father leaned across the table and looked at me and said, what are you doing at night? And I said, well, I'm hanging out with the, the guys. He said, well, 
why don't you go to college? Now that was really strange for me. My father had never mentioned the word college in my 17 years of existence. I had never heard him say that word. And I looked at him and, and I said, well, why, why do I want to go to college? And he said, to meet smart women, stupid. So I ended up going to college at a place called Adelphi University, which was the first one in the book, and it happened to be very close to my house. So, you know, I wasn't going to make this a career. I was just going to go to school to meet smart women. So why not stay close to home? Charles Evans, this is personal, his background. What was your approach to how you're going to get the public interested in this subject? Um, well, I started, I, I produced um, the film with without this get to know Victor sequence and and the little bit that follows it, uh, but it, it seemed out of the blue. So I felt like we had to get to know him, know where he came from, and know the remarkable obstacles that he overcame to become a an academic, uh, you know, force. And I, I think that helped ease us into the story. How did someone spend 15, 16 years on a documentary financially? How did you set that up? Um, I financed the development of it for a long time myself, my film company, and um, I don't discuss the, you know, who financed the entirety of the film. Well, what I, the, what I mean by that is, do you have the finances ahead of time or did you have to keep getting money as you went along? I, I had the wherewithal to develop the project and I needed um, a green light from somebody to make the film, and, and I got that. I heard you in the documentary suggest that you're being paid to go around the country by the tobacco companies. Not quite exactly that. Explain but that, though, and what is the law today? Sure. Uh, the national settlement that came down uh, stated that the tobacco industry has to pay individual states certain amounts of money to because they, they basically lie to the states and lie to the people. So this money comes into the states and, and some of it goes into public health departments and some of it goes into into tobacco training grants. And the public health departments call me and they say, look, you know, we've got this money from the tobacco industry, we've got to spend it on something. You know, why don't we pay your salary to come talk to our kids? So, you know, again, I'm being paid by public health, but the money kind of trickles in from the tobacco industry. So in, in, in my sort of small world, it's like I'm getting paid by the industry to tell kids about the industry. There's something nice about that for me. But if you're working for a tobacco company, aren't you, there's something not nice about that. What's their reaction? He's not working for the tobacco industry. He's working to educate kids about the tobacco industry. No, no, I'm talking about if you're working for the tobacco oh. company and you watch this money leave them, go to the states, and end up, and I'm, there's a lot of other things they do with the money besides having uh, Victor DeNoble out there. They were very fortunate to be able to pay that money because had they not, they would have been bankrupted by a, an, aw an awesome array of lawsuits that were um, scheduled for trial. And the film documents this, how they got off the gallows and um, were able to negotiate themselves into, uh, you know, another few couple decades or a few decades of, of selling tobacco. What was the direct result of those hearings? Oh, uh, the hearings resulted in uh, massive lawsuits filed by plaintiff attorneys on behalf of, of people who got hurt from t tobacco. And not on behalf of the people who got hurt, but on the people who paid taxes and money for health insurance to, to take care of those folks. Uh, it resulted in the, the Attorney General settlement, which it covered almost all 50 states. Um, it resulted eventually in 2009 when President Obama signed the, the Smoking Family uh, Smoking Act. Uh, and now that leads to regulation of the tobacco industry in the future. Is this a partisan issue at all? It is one of the rare moments when both sides came together and voted in overwhelming numbers to regulate the tobacco industry. I think Judge Kessler's ruling in 2006, the, the RICO, the finding that the industry had perpetrated 50 years of fraud against the American people. Um, it's little known, but was widely read and very much influenced law lawmakers. It, it's a disgusting um, chronicle of, it's, it's a thorough and encyclopedic and withering, uh, how do I say, um, summation of their um, bad behavior uh, over the last 50 years. I read that far, uh, far and above everybody else is China and 300 and some million people smoking over there in China. 5.5 trillion cigarettes smoked a year? 
Yeah, that's I mean, the numbers are overwhelming. Oh, there is. <clears throat> Have, how are these companies today financially, all the American-based tobacco companies? Oh, they're financially quite sound. I mean, uh, the largest, the most profitable market is still the United States. So the tobacco companies here, so, you know, that penny for penny make more on, the, on the, their sale of cigarettes here. And what you have in, in China and, and also in Japan is the tobacco industry is having a hard time getting in there because the tobacco industry, for example, in Japan is owned by the federal government. So they are limiting the number of U.S. imports that come in. The same thing with China. They're limiting the number of imports that come in. So in these other countries, the, the tobacco conglomerates in those countries are actually holding the American companies at bay um, because the American companies know that in, in 20 years, um, they, they're probably not going to be selling their products here. How many people worked on this documentary with you? Wow. No one's asked me that question. I, well over 100, all departments. You, you need a, a basically a f the, f the same crew that a small narrative film needs to make recreations and then animators and a lot of people. Yeah. Here's some, a, a clip with uh, Dr. DeNoble from your documentary. I got a list of all the chemicals in cigarette smoke. I had a hunch one of them might be an addictive drug. Victor de Noble was the first one to look at the question of, of does acetaldehyde play some role in tobacco dependence or addiction? Up until that time, we had been looking at nicotine as a chemical, the primary one that everybody knows about. Chemicals interact with receptors, and the way nicotine works, it interacts with a particular receptor. And so if I can make that receptor let's say, more receptive to nicotine with another chemical, then it enhances the effect of the addiction or of the chemical. Could acetaldehyde be an addictive drug? We didn't know, so we asked the rats. Explain. One of the things we found out early on is that uh, rats would work to get nicotine, but they wouldn't work very hard for it. And that's not surprising, because they don't work very hard for alcohol either. We know, al we know alcohol is an addictive drug. But why would so many people be addicted to tobacco smoke if it's okay, but it's not great? And that led us to think maybe there's something else in there. So we went through the chemicals and I found this chemical called acetaldehyde. And I knew from previous research that when acetaldehyde, this chemical, gets into our brain, it reacts with a chemical called dopamine and it forms another chemical that looks like cocaine. So we did a whole series of studies and we showed two things that are very important. One is that acetaldehyde does enhance the effect of nicotine in the brain. It makes it more addictive. Equally important is that acetaldehyde by itself is an addictive drug. So now you've got two things in, in cigarettes and tobacco smoke that are causing addiction, not one. And, and that, seemed, that was a very, very critical finding uh, for the company. They asked us to figure out how much levels of nicotine and acetaldehyde rats liked. You know, we're starting off one to one, is it two to one? one? And the bottom line was we came up with that rats liked a little bit more acetaldehyde than they did nicotine. We can't prove this. I can only tell you what the data suggests. Brown and Williamson retro-engineered Marlboro. They figured out what was in there. We reported more acetaldehydes better in 1982. In 1983, Philip Morris began adding sugar to the Marlboro cigarette. When you burn sugar, you form acetaldehyde. And if you look at the history of Marlboro, the sugars went up by about 26%. The acetaldehyde went up by about 40%. And it wasn't until around 1986 or 7, I don't know the exact date, Marlboro did become the best-selling cigarette in the world with this altered chemical structure. Owned by Philip Morris. Correct. The Philip Morris company is how big and how does that relate to the Altria name? Uh, I, I think Altria is the, is, the, is the overall corporate name for a whole series of companies, which Philip Morris was one, Miller Brewing used to be part of it, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, I'll forget the other ones, uh, not Kraft. Um, but Philip Morris is a huge company. It, 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 I don't know how big you, in, in dollars it is. My, Charlie might know, but I don't. But it is, it is a massive organization. A, at, at the time um, that Victor was doing the work, <clears throat> finding that more of this drug makes them press levers much more. We have 
documented um, science that they changed the recipe for Marlboros and continued to change it until it reflected the ratio that Victor found in 1982 was the optimal amount that they would um, that they liked the best, and that's such a, a great and dramatic thing. And we didn't have the time to even put it into the movie. What is if, if someone today smokes a cigarette? How many different things, and that's not the word, it, are put in there by the tobacco companies to enhance that? Smoke. Yeah. It, let's go. Let me take it back a little bit basic. Just take tobacco. A cigarette with no additives, just pure tobacco. If you analyze it, there's about 300 chemicals in there. You mean when, as it comes off the leaf? Yeah. Take, just roll it up and analyze it, about 300 chemicals. When you burn it, those 300 chemicals mix together and they form 4,000 chemicals. That's not additives. That's just from burning natural tobacco. So a person with no additives in their product at all is inhaling about 4,000 chemicals. I've heard numbers, the new numbers come out now from, from the, uh, up to 7,000 chemicals, but I'll be conservative and say there's 4,000. And now there's additives, and you throw those additives in, and you're making all sorts of chemicals. So uh, there's chemicals in there. There's at least 50 of them that produce cancer. There's plutonium-210, cadmium, C14. There's formaldehyde, acetaldehyde. You go down, there's rat poison in there. There's all sorts of things that are made when you burn a tobacco product. I want to go back and show the hearing itself that you saw. Where were you when you saw this hearing? Um, I think I was at my uncle's house. Uh, I was at a relative's house. Uncle at West Coast, uh, West Coast. New York. <clears throat> um, there were seven people, I believe, up there testifying from the tobacco companies. How yeah. many of those tobacco companies still exist? Or do, I'm not sure. All of the companies still exist. All the CEOs have gone. All of these CEOs that we're about to see have gone. All seven have, have retired, like the Walt Bond. He, Walt says they, they, they want to get, perfect their golf game. All, sevens have le all seven CEOs left the industry. Within a year of, or within a year of the event, hearing really? of the hearing, yeah. uh, here is the clip. I think you're going to see Ron Wyden, who was a congressman then. He's now a senator from Oregon. Let's watch. I'm going to go right down the row and ask each one a simple question. They're under oath. And we'll see what their response is. The first one. I believe nicotine is not addictive. Yes. I asked the second one. Cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. There is no right. intoxication. We'll, we'll take that as a no, just yes or no. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. Not addictive. Not addictive. Not addictive. Not addictive. Mr. Horgan, did this group discuss the need to state clearly in the same words as you all did, in the same words that nicotine is not That's addictive? That's absolutely outrageous. What, what is outrageous? That is outrageous for you to assume that we meet and talk about these issues. We are com competitors, we're independent, we're fighting for survival in a legitimate marketplace. It's very difficult for me to, to find you at this table characterizing anything as outrageous after seven apparently intelligent people have stood here and told the American people, 250 million of which know better, that cigarettes are not addictive. What could be more ridiculous? So if we appear a little skeptical of your answers in other areas, you'll understand why. You alluded to this earlier. Why do you think it took so long for the Congress or the government to do something about this problem? I mean, they've been studying this issue from way back in the 60s. The tobacco industry, the companies came together in 1953 and formed a very tight uh, union, sort of OPEC of tobacco you know, growers. And they... Um, they agreed to not let out any science that would be incriminating to them to actively uh, put up a public face to, um, to that we are concerned about the health of our customers and, and to actively pledge to make, you know, to spend a, a lot of money on science that would, um, you know, would investigate this on, you know, in the interest of the consumer. And th they successfully kept doubt about the toxic nature of their product uh, and did and effectively kept a lid on employ employees uh, talking to the media. They had a perfect record of success until 1994. One of the things interesting. One of the CEOs there. How dare you suggest that we get together, which is an antitrust 
violation in this particular industry. But um, what Mr. Evans is suggesting is that they had this trade group that allowed them to get around it. Do you want to give any more oh, background from your perspective? Sure, there's no question. I mean, uh, the, the tobacco industry, while they may not have shared secrets about their products, they certainly shared strategies. Uh, in fact, one of the, Philip Morris had a scientist that was actually sitting uh, on the Surgeon General's committee in Washington and would listen to things about tobacco and before that person would go back to uh, New York, they would stop off in Richmond, Virginia and report to the industry what the Surgeon General was thinking and then he would go back home. And that information was shared among the companies. So while, while it's true they didn't share trade secrets, they most certainly shared strategy and logistical situations on how to deal with the government. No question about that. What have the tobacco companies said about the addiction part of this? Well, uh, until the year 2000, they claimed it still wasn't addictive. It's not addictive. It doesn't cause cancer. It doesn't cause heart disease. And all of a sudden, in the year 2000, they said, oh, you know something? We knew it all along. And we just forgot to tell you. And these guys had all left by then. They had all gone by then. That's correct. All seven executives had, had, had retired at that point, and new people were brought in. What impact do you think this hearing had on those seven executives? Uh, it clearly greased the wheels for their departure. Uh, they were a big liability and a national laughing stock, if you can laugh about it. Um, they swore what everyone intuited and knew was not true. And then two weeks later, what's so very dramatic about the timing is that two weeks later in that same room, a fellow comes along and refutes what they all said. In a matter of fact, no ax to grind scientific way. What's the other, I mean, we're sitting here talking about a documentary that's definitely against tobacco, against these, the addiction and all that. What's the other side of this? Is there, are there people still taking the other side of this? Um, I, 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 don't, I think it's not anti-tobacco. I, I think what it is, it's a historical perspective for you, the, 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 list, the reader, the listener, the, the observer, to, to make a decision. You know, had, had, had that hearing with the seven executives been a closed hearing, and had all those words never been made public, I don't think anything really would have come about. It was, it, as Charlie said, this was the first hearing gavel to gavel that was, that was televised on C-SPAN. And the public for the first time got to see seven people obviously lying to Congress, well, uh, obviously being delusional to Congress. Do you think they were lying or do you think they were, had convinced themselves that they were I, I, right. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think at, at the best you can probably say is they were totally delusional. They bought into their own ideology of what tobacco was. And I think the worst case you can say they actively lied uh, to Congress. But I don't know whether they lied or they're just totally delusional. Many, many grand juries were convened to per prosecute them for perjury. And there were technicalities that dissolved these... Um, you know, the teeth in these uh, efforts. So uh, it, it, it's widely believed in law enforcement that they were lying, but they couldn't be prosecuted for it. Why do you think uh, this country spends billions of dollars fighting the drug war? Mm -hmm. from Mexico and South America and Afghanistan for all that uh, matters. Why do we spend so much money and have a drug, I mean, a war against drugs, but if this is a proven addiction, we don't shut it down completely? There are a lot of addicts in this country, and I think it's being studied right now by the newly empowered FDA. Um, how do you get wean people off of nicotine without having some sort of a you know eco cataclysmic economic uh, fallout from 40 million Americans who are or 25 million Americans, 40 million, 40 million Americans who um, can't go to work or are are just L far less functional. How much of this is tied to the tax benefits to the states? You know, I, people say that, but I think if you if you look at if you look at and I, I, don't, like, I don't know what the numbers are. I, I know what generally what they are. If you look at how much money you bring in from the tobacco industry, you sp you spend twice that amount of money on health care costs. So if you bring in twenty cents, you're spending sixty cents on health care costs. How much money do the tobacco companies have to give the states now? Um, oh, gee, it's hundreds of billions of dollars over the next uh, 25 years. So it continues. It continues. It's it's a, it's a payment plan over 25 years, and I think the, the 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 thing with the drugs that you mentioned is that tobacco of of, of all, a third of the people who use tobacco will die prematurely. 
The other two thirds will have long term health care problems, COPD, cancer, emphysema. The problem is, is tobacco does these things 20 years from now. Methamphetamine, cocaine, alcohol, they are acute drugs. They do the damage very, very quickly. So we see that. We see a kid on the street smoking a cigarette. We're not going to see him in the hospital for 20 or 30 years. And I think that, that, that break is why we don't focus on the tobacco. Are you going to add something to that? Um, no, I, I was just going to say something about it being an anti-tobacco movie or not. I, I think it's a, a corporate cautionary tale or a, you know, a, a window on the disgrace of an industry or what happens when, um, when bad public opinion uh, turns on an industry and realizes that it's doing very bad. Um, there are economic consequences and you know, these will, I think, be paid in the next couple of generations. Much, they'll pay much more dearly than they have yet. How long is your documentary? Uh, 100 minutes. When will it be available for the public to buy on DVD? It'll be September, October. Of this year. And yes. how long do you expect it to be in theaters around the country? The next 10 weeks or so. Let's, um, we'll take some of our own footage, not yours, <clears throat> from the hearing. And the late Michael Sinar, who died of a brain tumor, is my memory correct, from Oklahoma, right. a Democrat, is questioning you back on this subject. The subcommittee contacted Dr. DeNoble and Mr. Campbell to ask his version of the events, and Dr. DeNoble informed this subcommittee that he would be unable to talk to us because it may be subject to a confidentiality agreement that he has with your company, Philip Morris. Therefore, would, it would bar the testimony of Dr. DeNoble because of that agreement. Mr. Campbell, will you release Dr. DeNoble from his confidentiality agreement so that he can p appear voluntarily before this subcommittee to tell us what really happened? I don't know of the confidentiality agreement, so I'd have to have an investigation, will you, but then I will answer. Will you release Dr. DeNoble from any contractual arrangements that will allow him to voluntarily testify before this subcommittee? Dr. DeNoble is quite on record in, in a number Yes in a or no. Of will you allow Dr. DeNoble to come forward? I, I see no problem, and our people will discuss, you, discuss no, it with you. No, that's not the question. Mr. Campbell, Dr. DeNoble will voluntarily appear if he can get through the agreement that he has with your company. Will you release him from that agreement? Can I check with my counsel at this time? I just want to know. You're the chairman of the board. No, I'm not, sir, but I'm, I'm just the president, but... Uh... Mr. Sinar, uh, <laughs> let's give him a minute. All right. <laughs> you will do it, sure. Thank you. I forget how many of those are your edits and not mine. <laughs> well, those are all... That's actually our video. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's... I, I had, thought that I had made those cuts, but you did. <laughs> you, were you in the room? I was not, no. Were you watching that? I was watching. Uh, we were home, we were instructed to stay home, and uh, we were being uh, protected uh, by s the FBI. Where were you? In Delaware, yeah. And, and you were instructed to stay home? We were asked to stay home and stay out of the public light and just kind of watch the hearing and digest what was going on. And, Why? Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to see what the CEOs were going to say, and I knew I was going to have to respond to it. And I hoped that I was going to have to respond to it. I didn't know if we were going to get released from that secrecy agreement. I mean, had Mr. Campbell said no and just said no and ended it, the, and I had not been released, the tobacco industry lawyers would have blocked my testimony from ever being heard, at least legally anyways. Um, so that was a critical, critical moment for us, that when he said, sure, we'll do it, I mean, there was an amazing sense of relief. I've got to show this from the documentary. It'll make sense. Let's just run this clip. I remember I received a, a phone call from my mother, who had received a phone call from one of her friends. And she called and she said, Victor's on television. And of course, a lot of friends, my three friends, called him a... What do they call those people that um, talk? Um, Informant? Who? Informant? Something like that. And a couple of them really ticked me off. Uh, listen, you're talking about my kid. You don't do that. Take it for what it's worth. Whatever he's doing, he's doing for, the, for everybody, not for himself. 
Mr. Evans, who did the interviews? Oh, I did, yeah. And when was that? That was in 2009, summer of 2009, Where I did think. you do the interviews? Um, we were in Long Island, New York. No, that was Richmond. That was Richmond. I did his sister in Long Island. Um, Richmond, Virginia, that yeah. one. Mom's still alive? She passed on June 15th. June 15th of last year? Yes. I see both of you rather emotional about this. This obviously affected you, Mr. Evans. Why? Because Victor's mom was a really lovely person. And what was her reaction to you being in the spotlight like this? Um, her, I didn't tell them what was happening. I wanted to protect them. So they, they didn't know what was going on until they saw it on C-SPAN. And <clears throat> she called me up that, that night and she said, um, you tell the whole truth. <laughs> See, yes. She said she was proud. Your sister, is this the sister that still smoked? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> now, do you give her advice yourself on uh, how to get out of this? No, I, I, my mother both smoked too, and, and, and I told my mother, this is about 1960 something, I said, Mom, I'm not going to bother you about smoking. I know it's crazy. I said, do me a favor, just go exercise three times a week. And my mom did. She joined the YMCA and she used to swim three times a week. And my sister is now doing the same thing. I recognize that some people can't overcome the addiction, and these happen to be two people who, who can't. So my sister now, every morning, goes downstairs and gets on that treadmill and does her thing, and she's cut down from two packs a day to five cigarettes a day. And proud of her she'll stick with it and and maybe in the future she'll be successful how often do you talk to young people wow uh i do about 400 presentations each year i do three programs a day five days a week so i'm in 15 schools each week where do you live now i live in san diego i i travel all over the country uh, i've been in going back to s the same schools for now sometimes 15 16 years i've gone to three and four and five different principals um, and uh, the school I don't ever promote. I have no website. I don't do anything. It's all word of mouth. How do you get the kids' attention? It's, it's really easy. Um, I just tell them I'm a scientist and uh, uh, I do drug research, but I don't work with people. I work with animals. And I have a picture of a rat up there and I explain what I do. And it, it's amazing to me. I, I, I don't know how or why I have such a nice way with kids but they just seem to gravitate to the science. I never tell them what to do. Never say don't and shouldn't. It is their choice. And I tell them that. Nobody's gonna stick a needle in your vein. Nobody's gonna pill in your, put a pill in your mouth. You'll decide to do that. I know you're only 12 years old, but it is your decision. It's not your parents, not your teachers. It's not peer pressure. You're gonna choose. And I think that resonates with kids, that it is their choice, and they have the right to choose. How much taping did you do of uh, Dr. DeNoble? I, you know, 10, 15 plus presentations, many of them, multiple cameras toward the end, you know, when I knew exactly what I needed. What was the toughest part of making this documentary and why did it take so long? Um, it took so long because I needed an ending. I needed to know, you know, in an ongoing story about an industry that, you know, um, is, hasn't really been uh, too badly impacted. Um, the, the bill being signed into law of FDA overseeing them kind of culminates what, ha what began in these subcommittee rooms, the coming to, you know, the, the disgrace of an industry to the point that they needed to be lumped in with all the others. They were no longer a special case. They were no longer protected. and. Um, given this, the exemptions from all other consumed products that had been the case before that. Here's some more. Um, th this is a little clip. I believe he's an attorney. Russ Herman? Yes. In, from Louisiana? Yes. New Orleans, yeah. Uh, when I ask you why you use this. In 21 days, about three weeks, that rat will wake up. He will clean himself. He will eat. He will drink. No. He does none of those things in three weeks. He wakes up. First thing he does in the morning, goes over that switch. And they were hitting that switch 90 times a day, and they needed nicotine. In fact, they, the first thing they did in the morning was hit that switch, just like a smoker. And the last thing they did at night was hit that switch, just like a smoker. And I said, King Chickabobo. 
King Chickabobo. That's uh, sort of an expression. Uh, us, uh, Louisiana uh, lawyers use when uh, when you got the jackpot. Mr. Evans, had you ever heard King Chickabobo before? <laughs> <laughs> no, man. It, it's a moment of interview gold. I, I just trying not to laugh until after he said it, and then I didn't know he was going to say it again, and I, you know, just missed getting on the, his repetition of it. It was one of the great thrills. Anybody from the tobacco industry uh, agree to be interviewed that works for the tobacco industry now or, you know, during the time they talk to you? Uh, during, during the time that the film covers, yeah. yes. Um, I was fortunate enough to have one highly placed and very visible um, tobacco attorney gone, a, de a defense attorney gone, tobacco executive, uh, Phil, um, Stephen Parrish, and after a, a long time of being an off-camera um, background uh, resource or consultant, he um, agreed to he had comfort level with the project and agreed to go on camera to give a window on what was going on in their ranks while all of these uh, news, news bombshells were going off all around them. You were seen there uh, talking about the rats and then King Chickabobo's uh, advocate uh, talked about this. What, what, the, what is that? Um, to determine whether a drug is addictive, r rats are placed in a little box, and the boxes have two little levers in them. And if you press one lever, it activates a pump, and the drug goes right into the, the vein. If you press the other lever, nothing happens. So the, the rat pressing that switch, that's how it comes in contact with the drug. And it presses the switch only because it's curious, just like we're curious. And once that drug goes in, the rat's brain begins to change, and over time, the rat will get addic addictive. Addiction isn't an event. It's a process of changing the way your brain works. And it takes rats anywhere between 20 to th sometimes 35 days to get addicted to a drug, just like it takes a person a while, too. So pressing that switch, in the beginning of the movie, you'll see actually the animation that Charlie used is fabulous, because he actually shows the rats and animated rats pressing a switch and the nicotine going in. So what Russ Herman was talking about was those rats pressing those switch in those boxes. And I thought this was a really important point to drive home or to include in, in the film because I wanted kids to understand that they were changing their brain whenever they are putting a drug in there. Um, it's actively changing your brain and producing things that wouldn't normally happen. And, and this is horrifying to kids, um, more so than to older people. And it is, I think, a small part of the reaction the reactiveness of the kids to, to Victor's um, presentations. How many kids well, smoke? It's around 26% of the high school population. Um, and that varies from state to state. In, in California, for example, it's only around, uh, it's, it's around 20, around 16, I'm sorry, 16%. If you go to states like Michigan, you have find up in 34%. The average is about 26%. So we still well, Michigan's 34%? Yes, some states are higher, some states are lower, depending upon. Uh, have you looked into why California at 16 and Michigan at 34? California has one of the most comprehensive anti-tobacco programs, and it has had that for over 20 plus years. So California was one of the first ones to ban smoking in restaurants and bars. It was one of the first ones to require tobacco education. And other states are now coming on board with that. Florida is another great state that's been doing that as well. So it depends on h how much money you have in the state and, and you know, whether you can provide this type of education. Education is the key. And we've, it, we've seen it in California. We've seen it in other states. The more educated your fifth and fourth graders are on tobacco, the better off they're going to be making a good choice. How about the world? What have you found out about the world and smoking and where does the United States fit in to that and s statistically? I'll just stick with the film and the world and know that there's a lot of interest worldwide and it's a huge problem worldwide. I'm not the great one on statistics for smoking in the world. What will make this a documentary for you a success and do you expect to make money off it? Um, I am going to work really hard to try to have it make money. I don't know that it will, but it would be important for me if they're still showing this in schools in 10 or 20 years, that would be a great thrill to me.
What about you? Uh, I think the documentary is going to be a success because we're not only going to roll it out here, we're going to modify it and shorten it and offer it to schools and and offer it to, to folks to use as, as an educational tool. And I think based on my history, what I see kids coming up to me in college and say, I saw you 10 years ago, I, I have very high hopes that kids will look at this 10 years from now and say, you know, wow, you know, that that really happened back then? And teachers can use it as a, as a tool, as an educational tool for history. And, and we were in a screening last night at, here, here in Washington, and um, a kid in the front row said, I, I, was just, I was just a couple of years old when this happened, all of this happened. He wouldn't have, without, without this film, it was clear that this historical reference, this, all of this bad behavior that is, people feel that it's secondhand knowledge now. I mean, people feel it's matter of fact. And um, I think this, pe people need to be reminded of, of the potential for corporations um, when they are, they, they are allowed to run wild and not be, um, and, and there's a big uh, toll, you know, in human life. Pe people will, people will produce lethal products for profit, um, you know, unless they are regulated. Who narrated your documentary? There was no narrator. Um, it was told in a mosaic of interviews, and that was, I think, one of the great s successes of it for, for me personally, because I don't like to be told what to think, just like to be told a story, and a, it, the interviews dovetail together enough to have a good narrative going. Here is uh, one last clip uh, you've testifying. This is our video, not the documentaries. Now, we're also interested in some developments in uh, middle 83, uh, where you and some researchers flew from Richmond, uh, Virginia to New York City to brief the senior management on your work. Uh, can you walk us through what happened uh, on some of those key events uh, that started back in Richmond? Sure. Uh, we were notified by our senior management that, that uh, we were going to be going to New York corporate headquarters to give a presentation on the activities of the Behavioral Pharmacology Laboratory. Uh, we were taken to the airport, put on a company jet, uh, flown up to New York, and one of the, the, the PM1 limousines uh, met us and, and took us over to the corporate headquarters. Uh, at that point, we gave a presentation to several uh, members of uh, New York corporate staff, uh, had entertained questions, had lunch uh, in the corporate uh, executive dining room, and then were flown back that evening on the company jet. What kind of questions were you asked at the New York briefing? I was only asked one question. What was that? Uh, I can't quote it, but it, I'll paraphrase it. And it. It's basically, why should I risk a billion dollar industry on rats pressing a lever to get nicotine? And this was a Philip Morris executive who asked you that question? Uh, yes, it was. Gentlemen, you would be happy to you tell us who was at this meeting I, I, I've been racking my brain and I can't. There's only one individual that I can remember who was there, and that was a, a, a lady named Carolyn Levy, Dr. Levy. Were these top management people? Yes, they were. Thank you, Mr. Would it be fair to say that the senior management people were troubled or worried about the work that you were doing? From that meeting, I, I didn't think so. In fact, uh, on the way back in the plane, we all thought things went very, very well. Um, However, uh, subsequently after that meeting, we were, we were told that uh, our laboratory might be shut down, and, and, uh, but they wanted to continue the research, and the possibility was that we would uh, be set up a laboratory in Lausanne, Switzerland, to continue the research. Put this again in, in context. That was 1994. Correct, yes. How long did you work for Philip Morris? I worked there from 1980 to 1984. And that was where? In Richmond, Virginia, at the Research Center. And what were, the, what were your circumstances? Did you have a contract with them? No, I was an active employee. I was an active Philip Morris employee, had my Philip Morris badge, and you know, was a member of the, of the company. Um, we developed a laboratory inside the company itself to do animal research. They didn't have that, so we had to build it. Uh, we did our research, uh, signed a secrecy agreement, and we were fired on April 5th, 1984. So we were there a little over four years. And then we were silenced by a secrecy agreement that we had signed from 84 to 94 until that congressional hearing where Mr. Campbell eventually released my, myself and Dr. Paul Mealy. 
And two weeks later, we were brought before Congress to, to, sh to give testimony, the testimony of her. Why did you sign a, a secrecy agreement? It's not unusual. Actually, when you work for most corporations, even pharmaceutical companies, you sign an agreement that, you know, things you, you, you invent, they own, things you learn there, you can't divulge. But the difference was, if you go to a pharmaceutical company, there's always a time limit. Like, if you leave, you can't, you can't work on the same product for maybe five years. This was a lifelong agreement that we signed. So once you sign this agreement, for the rest of your life, you will never discuss what you've done in a tobacco industry. That was the major difference. I want to show both of you some photographs that, and, and I don't know that you know anything about this. This has nothing to do with your doc documentary per se. Let's just put one up on the screen, and this has to do with the FDA, and you can see that's a man that has a, I guess his larynx was taken out. or Trick tube. A, a, um, warning, cigarettes are addictive. This man, I believe, is supposed to be passed. I'm not sure. Yes, he's got uh, Warning, smoking can kill you, and you can see he's had his chest opened up. To to, uh, smoke uh, can harm your children. And finally, cigarettes cause strokes and heart disease. Yes. Do you know what this is all about? Sure. These are the new warning labels that the FDA wanted to put on the new packs of cigarettes. And the tobacco industry, the, the, so the, the FDA advisory committee recommended these warnings. The tobacco industry went to the courts and said, no, these are a violation of First Amendment rights because these warnings are not based on scientific evidence. These warnings are based upon supposition, and the courts upheld the tobacco industry's position. What they've, the courts have said is this is a violation of your right. They can't force you to counter-advertise on your own product. The, cat, the interesting thing, though, and the tobacco industry knows this, is that warning labels in Australia are almost three quarters of the pack and are of those graphic natures. And the amount of smoking in Australia is almost the equivalent to that in but the, the United the, States. A judge, a federal judge, stopped this. Correct. And it, did you know what reason he gave? Have you followed this? Not closely enough to talk about it. Yeah, no, the federal judge stopped the warning labels based upon First Amendment rights. What he said was that the, the FDA does not have the right to force you to counter-advertise on your own product. On your own, well, you said that earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of this is, I think, these, these are all small little skirmishes that are, while they're important, you know, um, locally, um, the big picture is the re that the FDA is currently empowered to reduce nicotine content in tobacco products to the point that they are not, a, they won't sustain addiction. And this is the hope of anti-tobacco advocates um, who, I, I think Americans are strongly, um, s strongly uh, unite, or a, a vast majority of Americans, I think 80% or in the high 70s, agree that they don't want kids in the future smoking. And even smokers included in that number um, the question is how to get these, um, how to get the addicts off without having economic repercussions, and um, the hope is that the FDA will it is taking these steps and will make a regulation um, for uh, nicotine reduction over time uh, to the point that tobacco will be a memory for most people. One of the things, we don't have a clip of this, but one of the things that uh, got my attention in your documentary is you used some, uh, a couple of interviews with um, Peter Jennings interviewing, I don't mm -hmm. remember who he was interviewing in, in the... Uh, uh, two, I think two different people in the course of the, the film. Yeah, but my point on this is that he died of lung cancer. Mm -hmm. He was a smoker. And I wonder at the time, did. Either one of you ever meet him or ask him about this? I was interviewed by Peter Jennings back in uh, 94, 95, and actually Peter Jennings had, had quit smoking and actually started smoking again uh, at 9-11. Uh, um, and we never broached the idea, the, the fact that he smoked, but he was, he was clearly aware that it was a drug. He was clearly aware that he was, he was addicted to that drug. And I think this is what's so interesting is that, that you, can, you can do this thing and if you're going to get cancer, and even if you stop smoking, y you may already have it. You may, ha you may suffer the consequences later on in life, which Peter Jennings did. And I think that's a very important point for young people. It's not so much whether you live or die. Yes, it, it's important. But it's how the, what your quality of life is going to be when you get older. Let me ask you about the, it's a long time, September, before this is released on a DVD and it'll be mm -hmm. in the theaters, as you said, for 10 weeks or so. Are you going to allow uh, Dr. Denoble to use it with kids now? 
um, Dr. DeNoble um, can do whatever he wants with my movie, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but you know, he, he his presentation and and he speaks widely um, to several hundred thousand kids a year. He's on the road two hundred days a year, and um, I, I think the the in the face-to-face -face approach is the one that Victor favors. What if somebody's watching this saying, I want Victor DeNoble in my kid's classroom? There's a website for www.addictionincorporated.com. It's the website for the movie. And you can go on there and you can leave a message on there and somebody will get back to you and we can figure out how to do that. All right, in a couple minutes we have remaining. Let me just say some things and you guys react quickly to it. The people that work at Philip Morris or any of these companies are good people, I am sure. They are parents. They have children and all this stuff. What is it that, what, what happens to the <laughs> the addiction brain here that they keep selling this knowing that it's that's going to cause all the problem? What, 400 and some thousand people die a year from smoking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if you're working in tobacco, you, you're just a regular guy or, 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 or woman. And, and you're making it, you have a living, you got a family, you got a mortgage, you got a house and your kids. And what, I mean, do, do, do you morally say at this point, I'm going to stop doing this completely, I'm going to do something else, and I'm going to earn half the money, and in today's economy, you know, I may not even get a job. So these people are earning a living for their families. Are they bad people? Absolutely not. Mr. Evan? Um, and there's an interesting, um, like, um, syndrome has been compared to this by Phil Hiltz, uh, he was a New York Times writer, now is in Boston. He compared it to uh, its middle distance, where they they say some it, it's a job. Someone's going to do it if I don't do it, and and it's a comparison to it's it's a syndrome that was observed and theorized coming out of um, concentration camp guards, where they where they had to justify what they were doing, and it there's there's a whole line of rationale that they seem to embrace that allows them to cope with this sort of um, you know, awareness, peripheral awareness of all the carnage caused by the product that, they, that employs them. Have you gotten any reaction from the, any of the tobacco companies yet? None. And we would welcome it. Did anything happen to you during this time that they tried to stop you participating in this? Not at all. Uh, my only interaction with the tobacco industry is the depositions I gave you know, back in the 90s. Uh, but no, they've left me alone and they left the movie alone and we would welcome some. You live in San Diego, Victor De Noble, yes. and De, De Noble, excuse me, and you live in, in New, Los, Los New Angeles. York City. Oh, you're now in New York City yeah, where you live. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, if they want to get in touch with you on this, they can get on the website. Addictionincorporated.com. Gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Thank, thank you for so having much us. for having us. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.